I entered the business not as an intern, not, uh, not in the conventional way a lot of people did. The conventional way to enter the marketplace was as a, uh, as a clerk on the trading floor. But I had a business on, I had already had it started a business that was in the automotive industry. I was very passionate about it. I liked it. And I started to realize that it wasn't an industry I wanted to stay in the rest of my life. And at a very young age, I came down to the trade. I actually took a summer off and was going to kind of go discover myself and see what was out there. What happened is I came to the trading floor very early in that summer vacation, and my brothers were down there at the time. I had a couple of brothers in the business. And I looked around. I saw the trading floor. I'd never seen it before. I was amazed at the activity, the, the volume in it, the vibrance of it. And I looked at my brother. I said, this is great. He goes, you should come down and work here. I go, well, how am I going to do that? I know nothing about it. He turns around to one of his friends. He says, hey, Tommy, this is my brother. Hire him. He goes, OK, you got a job. Holly, go get him a coat. The next thing I know, I'm employed. I didn't know what I was going to be paid. I didn't know what the benefits were. I didn't even know what I was supposed to do. Uh, it took me two days to figure that out. Um, and then suddenly, I was being paid, I think, at the time, $450 a month, which was a, a pittance compared to the business I was running. But it was exciting, and it was passionate. Um, both Derek and John and Scott both mentioned passion. And it's, it's a, something that drives everyone in our industry. And not only our industry, but every successful person out there is passionate about what they do. I don't care what business you're in. Um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is, you know, I'll talk about passion at the end, but really about how do you get to the point in your career that you, you, you see what's going on or you, you've got the vision to, to act. And I call it, you know, the crystal ball. And while I don't have a crystal ball, no one else does, the whole object here is really about how the past, I'll start with how the past creates the future. And what I mean by that is many people look at the past and we say history, like when I was in school, I hated history. I didn't want anything to do with it. I thought, what's the point? I also didn't like economics, and both of those subjects fascinate me today. But you look at history, and it's the reason most of us aren't excited about it is because it's somewhat boring, you know, to look back and say, oh, so, so some guy created the wheel one day, or somebody invented the nail. You know, suddenly it's the alphabet, the furnace, medicine, which continues to change the way the world works today. Uh, the controlled nuclear reaction changes the balance of power in the world. So you start to look at history, and you start to realize that it is actually very exciting. There's an awful lot out there that it can teach you. All these big innovations. They really did one thing, and they created change, or they served a purpose. There was something that they were serving to create these innovations or these, these things they did, um, whether it was a discovery or, a, or, a, uh, you know, or coming up with a new process to do something. It, it fueled a change, and there's nothing we've seen do this more. Well, I shouldn't say that the Industrial Revolution saw a lot of that, but we really saw it with the Internet. And you guys have been the recipients of much of that. Most of you probably don't remember a world without the Internet. Uh, some of us do, or I should say everyone sitting in this front row probably does. Um, it, it's a, it was a different time. You didn't have the access to information you have today. So the internet age or the age of technology was a change, an overall change in the world. And what that, what, what that created was the opportunity to take advantage of it. So then we saw other things come out of it. And what we really need to know is what drives the change. So it doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you're in the financial services business or you're in the automotive business, it doesn't matter. What you need to know is what drives the change in your business to give you the knowledge base to look forward. And that's where history can help you. So if you look back, and I'll use the financial services industry as an example, because this is something I have looked at and have studied. I currently run an exchange, so much of what we do, we do is everything we do is regulatory or regulatorily orientated. We're, we're governed by the governing bodies. So if we look back in time and we say, OK, well, when, there's when big ups upsets or disruptions happen in the securities business, or rather I'll, t I'll use the option business, what drives that? Okay. Generally, it's always driven to begin with. It's driven by some event. An event happens. And whether it's a, a bank failure, a financial crisis, a, uh, a market crash, things like that, Suddenly, there's a lot of upset people. A number of people have lost money. There's been a lot of opportunity changed. And they, there's public outcry. The whole world gets very upset about it. There's a lot of things written about it, a lot of media surrounding it. And the regulatory wheels all kick into high gear. The regulators look at it. They study it. They create rules to, uh, to, to impact it. Suddenly, you've got change happening now in an industry that you've got to respond to. So now you can respond to that appropriately. Well, when you start to respond to that, this is the information that you've gotten now from the marketplace to say, the change is happening. How do I respond? And what do I do? This is the crystal ball. This is where you can look forward and see what's going to happen next. That takes me to the next point of 
like look, is looking through the trees. So now you say, okay, now that I have this information, I know change is happening. How am I going to take advantage of that change? Well, we've seen you know, instances of this in the past, um, but entire industries have been built on a single idea. Standard Oil is a great example. Rockefeller starts Standard Oil for one reason, to supply kerosene to the world, or rather to the United States. But he sees there's a problem, so he's providing refined oil or fuel to light homes, and he sees that there's a problem that many of the fuels are unstable. So he says, I'm going to standardize the process and create a stable fuel. Suddenly he owns 50% of the market in the United States. Now he's getting, becoming very wealthy, and he says, wait a minute, what other changes is this providing? Well, the automobile's being invented at the time. The automobile was viewed as a toy for the wealthy. Nobody really thought anything of it. People poo-pooed it. It wasn't going to work well. But Henry Ford comes along and creates the assembly line process. Rockefeller sees that. He and Ford coincidentally interacted quite a bit back then. And he says, I'm going to, I'm going to supply the fuel, because I'm in the fuel business, to the automotive industry. And then he grows that into a large corporation. At the same time, Ford grows into a large corporation. All this change was done from the simple beginnings of a single product, whether it was the combustion engine or refining fuel. So in the securities industry, we, we again see that, and we're able to respond to those changes. The, many of the firms that have done very well in the business, and many, and again, I'm not, it doesn't matter your buy side, sell side, and exchange, you've looked at the history, seen the change coming, and reacted to it and been ahead of it. Now, it's not hard to think about how do I respond, or I shouldn't say it's not hard, but it's easier to respond to different long-term, short-term changes that you're facing. So I'll use electric cars for an example. Uh, all these electric cars are impacting the world right now. People say, well, what is it going to be the long-term effect? Oh, it's going, to, it's going to impact the oil supply. I should go out and, sh and sell a whole bunch of oil futures. Well, that's probably not going to work out well for you. It's, uh, it's too long-term. You're going to have to stay short those for quite a number of years before the electric car business is going to impact the, product, the usage of oil in the world. But maybe instead you say, I'm going to take a look at the battery manufacturers, and I'm going to create or I'm going to create a portfolio of the companies that provide materials to the battery manufacturers, and suddenly you might have a good idea. An example, I never researched it, maybe it doesn't work, but that's a good example of it. So we continuously, or rather what I've done throughout my career, and I've had a very eclectic career starting on the trading floor. I've been in multiple industries, multiple businesses. I've always been dabbled in the automotive industry because I had a passion for it. But I've used this model to think about the future and be ahead of the curve when it comes to change. The secret is, is knowing where you sit in that, or where, where the best opportunity is, long, medium, or short term. Uh, it, that's by far the hardest part of it. But again, you can look at history and say what generally happens, and that'll give you quite a bit of those clues. Um, the third point I'm going to bring up is passion. And this was, again, talked about. Both Scott and Derek mentioned it a number of times. Um, passion is something that every industry is driven by tremendously. It's what drives you. It's, you know you're passionate about something if, before you make any decision in your life, those daily decisions you make, you think about that thing you're passionate about. You're not always passionate about one thing, and I'm not saying you have to be obsessive over your career, over your single job. Um, there's a number of things. For example, my family. I'm passionate about my family. If I'm going to take a, uh, a business trip, I think about the impact it's going to have to my children. Am I going to miss something, a birthday, an event, something like that? But at the same time, if I'm going to take a vacation with my family, I think about how that's going to impact my job. And it's not so much my job, but the career that I'm building. If I'm putting a new rule in place, if my guys come to me and say, hey, we want to make this pricing change or something else in the marketplace, I think about what is that going to do for the industry? Is it healthy for the, the options markets overall? I'm passionate about it, so I can, I'm concerned about the total market as well as the, how I relate to it personally. If you don't have that passion and you're in a career, in a, in a role or in a business and you don't have that passion, you go to work and you're like, oh, it's a job, I get paid and I really don't enjoy what I do. My first suggestion is do something different. You will not be successful at it. You'll be miserable at it. It's not something you want to do and continue to do throughout your life. Um, you've heard that from probably your parents. You'll hear it from us and you hear it from a number of people. It's true. It's a real, it, it's something you should listen to. Um, and it's, it's interesting how the, the, uh, the new digital age has changed this, too. If we look back at the industrial age, post-World War II, things like areas, times like that, towards the end of the industrial age, the, uh, the way businesses were structured actually destroyed passion. They created companies, and they said, okay, we're going to put a process in place. You're going to get a pension, and it sounded great. I can retire with a fixed income. 
but at the end of the day, you were in a process and you were just another piece of that wheel. The people who were the disruptors